Some of you may have seen my video about the most dangerous fountain in the world. It's a fountain that runs not on water, but on a liquid metal, an alloy of sodium and potassium, and uses a magnetohydrodynamic pump. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I recommend watching my video on it. It will be linked at the end of the video and in the video description. And in that very video, I already said that there will be a second, bigger and nicer fountain. Since my burner and my skills are not good enough for this, I met with Johan again. He already helped me to make KF flanges with a vacuum feed through. You can also find that video in the video description. Together, we built the only existing sodium-potassium alloy fountain in the world. Well, well, he's going to build it. I'm standing in the back and filming it. So, let's get started. Everything starts with the preparation. Johan makes the tools that he will need later. For example, a holder for the NS14 glass ground joint that would later be attached to the fountain. While he's doing that, I thought I would briefly show you his setup. Johan uses four oxygen concentrators to get the oxygen for his burner. The burner is a beautiful Bethlehem Bravo and the fuel is simple propane. Since it was the hardest part, we decided to first fuse the electrodes into the glass. For this, a glass tube was again slid over the tungsten electrode and melted. To get a good surface for fusing it to the glass tube, additional glass was applied and formed into a disc. This prepared tungsten electrode was then fused into a glass tube. To be able to melt on an electrode on the opposite side and at the same time have a way to blow into the tube, he creates a hole in the side and then melts on a second glass tube. He then bends it so that he can continue to turn the glass piece in the same axis. When blowing glass, one is often confronted with difficult questions. In what order should you perform the steps and how can you hold the glass part while you work on it? What you see here is a solution to such a problem and it is fascinating to see how a professional approaches these questions. The second electrode was then attached to the opposite side. Unfortunately, the tungsten came into contact with the side of the glass tube and formed a sharp edge. These sharp edges are stress razors that promote the formation of cracks in the glass. I probably would have just said good enough and hoped, but Johan couldn't live with it. The inside diameter of the tube was too small to fit the tungsten electrodes. Sure, we could have tried a dozen times and eventually it would have worked, but we decided to use a larger diameter tube instead. So he tried again and the second attempt was successful. As you can see, the tungsten is covered with a rather thick oxide layer, because it was held in the flame for a long time. I will try to dissolve it later with the help of some sodium hydroxide. Since the fountain needs to be cleaned anyway, this additional step is not a problem. Now let's continue working on the main body of the fountain. The 40mm tube was melted off at the end that will later be the top of the fountain and a small hole was created. The 
uh, NS14 glass ground joint is then attached to this hole. This joint is where the metal will at some point be added. In the next step, the nozzle of the fountain was attached to the pump. The pump only consists of the two electrodes in the T-piece. At this point, a thickening is also created on the glass, which is of crucial importance in the following step. Johann opens a hole in the other end, which will later be the bottom of the fountain, to be able to melt the nozzle into the main tube. And here you can see the function of the thickening. It serves as a shoulder that rests on the edge of the hole and enables Johann to fuse both pieces together. And it blows my mind that he is able to align the tube with the nozzle inside the large tube just by turning it the right way while it cools down. To avoid unnecessary tension in the glass at the junction, a hole is opened without letting the glass cool down, to which a tube is attached. This tube allows the metal to flow from the reservoir back to the pump. A lump of glass is then fused to the opposite side. At this point, a glass rod can be fused on, which will later become part of the base on which the fountain will stand. Since the metal alloy of sodium and potassium is highly reactive, I need a way to create a vacuum to remove residual moisture from the glass surface and then be able to feed argon into the fountain. For this purpose I decided to use a Young valve. This type of vacuum valve is very expensive, but tighter than a glass valve. And for this work of art nothing is too expensive. Apart from that I still had a Young valve laying around, just waiting for such a use. I didn't buy it. In order to attach the valve, the side opening must first be closed. In this case, no rubber stopper can be used, because it is too close to the flame and would melt. Therefore, Johann closes the side neck with a glass bead. It is important that he only heats the glass bead and not the opening. This allows him to create what is called a cold seal, which can be knocked off very easily later. If both pieces are heated, the glass will fuse permanently. With the side neck closed, the tap can be prepared to be mounted next to the NS14 glass ground joint. step is to connect the side tube which he attached before to the T-piece of the pump. Easier said than done, and this step also caused me problems when I was building my version. But there is a clever trick he will use that I was not aware of at the time. Johann starts by bending the tube a little to make it face the right direction. Then he bends the long tube, which is connected to the T-piece, so that it comes close to the previously prepared spot. But how do you connect the two opposite tubes now? For this Johann uses what is known as a Jesus seal. He heats both ends of the tubes and by blowing carefully he moves them towards each other until they touch. Mm -hmm. 
If everything has been done correctly, there is only a thin glass membrane separating the now connected tubes. This membrane can be broken by carefully heating and expanding the joint, resulting in a continuous tube. This technique requires the correct spacing of both ends of the tubes from each other and the correct thickness of the glass. What Johan makes look so incredibly easy is actually quite difficult. The last step is to attach the base of the fountain. For this, a glass rod is bent in the middle and both ends are temporarily connected with another glass rod so that he can hold onto it while working. The foot is then fused to the glass rod on the fountain. To ensure a good stand, both feet are angled perpendicular to the ground. I have tried to remove the tungsten oxide with a sodium hydroxide solution, unfortunately without success. What worked was a hot ammonia solution. As you can see, the oxide fell off the electrodes and partially dissolved. The surface of the electrodes is not perfect, but good enough. And now, look at this work of art. Isn't it beautiful? Before I can proceed, I need to have the fountain annealed to remove the stresses created by working on the glass. In the next video, I will build a beautiful wooden box on which the fountain will stand and which will contain the power supply. I can already see it in front of me and it will be an absolutely stunning piece of art. I can't wait to fill the liquid metal into the fountain and turn it on for the first time. If you don't want to miss the video, consider subscribing to my channel. Many many thanks to Johan for this gem and for his time. It was a fantastic day. And of course, thank you to my Patreons. Your support makes videos like this possible. If you want to support me too, you can find the link to my Patreon page in the video description. Thank you a lot for watching.